Right, in the interest of time, we might kick off. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are today. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of uh, Think Big. My name is Mahisha De Silva, and together with our marketing team, every quarter, uh, we work with our team of experts, sinking our teeth into issues of currency and concern for SME owners around the country. This edition, we turn our attention to the impact of rising inflation and interest rates on small businesses. And if, if you haven't had a chance to read the reports yet, we'll, we'll share a link to it shortly. Now, inflation has hit small business hard. Consumers continue to reduce their, their spending in the face of higher rates, and there is ongoing weakness in housing construction as well around the country. Um, these are all signs that indicate that, uh, that the Australian economy could deliver a second quarter of negative per capita GDP growth in the June quarter. So our panel today will tackle these issues and share their views on how SMEs are adapting to inflation. Um, and, um, and and what they're seeing across their major sectors as well. A um, uh, warm welcome to David Burton jones who's Chief Investment Officer at Aquitas Investment Partners. Uh, David works closely with the advisors of our financial planning and wealth management arm, and he also sits on the RSM Financial Services Australia Investment Committee. We also have Ross Patterson, who advises small businesses across a range of issues, including tax, cash flow management and asset protection. Ross is also our national leader for agribusiness. Also with us is Jessica Olivier, who provides specialist advice on accessing the R&D tax incentive and other government incentives. Uh, Jess also leads our manufacturing sector. We all know that no discussion on interest rates will be complete without our resident property expert. Adam Crowley leads the property and construction sector, and he also advises a broad range of clients in the industry on their accounting and tax needs, both locally and internationally. And to share some of his views from the capital markets, we've got um, Craig Amos from our corporate finance team, who regularly advises organizations on a range of transactional type issues. Our discussion today is an interactive one, so we encourage you to actively participate in um, by asking questions. Um, I know we have got uh, quite a few small business owners in the audience today as well, and so we'd love to hear from you. So feel free to post your questions in the chat. David will uh, kick things off with you. It's a tough job making economic predictions in this current climate. Um, can you please provide us with an overview of where you think Australia is sitting on the pathway to economic recovery. Well, I would be delighted. Thank you so much for having me. The economic projections part is easy. Sharing the screen fills me with dread, no matter how many times I've done it before. So I'm going to endeavor to do so now. I'm clicking the magic buttons that will hopefully bring my screen to life for you. Is that coming through? Can I check with you, Mahesh? Yes, great. I see yes. nodding. Nice and okay. clear. And I will toggle uh, for your viewing pleasure between the full screen mode and escaping out of it in order to, to reach the other slides across the deck. Now, today we're talking about the outlook for inflation. I think I'm talking for about 10 minutes to set the scene. And then I believe we'll go from there with the panel. I suppose some throat clearing or housekeeping. I'm a fund manager. So much of my presentation typically revolves around investment strategy which if you like, that's the nexus between investment opportunities, asset allocation, and the economy. So today's presentation is a bit more focused about the real economy and inflation in particular, and a bit less about investment markets. Now, inflation, it's a byproduct, if you like, of the interaction between output and interest rates. On the output side, by forces of aggregate demand relative to aggregate supply, with interest rates being the mechanism that equilibrates those two things. And those two things in turn will determine inflation. Now we're also pretty deeply connected or enmeshed with our trading partners, our global trading partners. So there is this common macroeconomic component to global demand. And as such, any discussion of inflation will start by looking at the US, the United States, and then move toward Australia where the relevance of this conversation will sit in our efforts to work out what's going on. So with that in mind, I'll begin to toggle across my slides and put it back into full screen mode for you. So this, this strategy deck 
I think it was mentioned just offline that it's about 92 pages long. It's available to any and all of you upon request. The key takeaway here is this idea of a soft landing that the Federal Reserve and other central banks can return inflation to target with the unemployment rate staying reasonably low. So that is surmised here in words in the top half of the screen as I glance down at my iPad and can see it's still coming through, which is good, which defines the market narrative. But I am going to show you pictorially what this looks like to help bring it to life more fulsomely. And that will mean that we toggle over to slide 33, which I will put back into full screen mode. So here we're looking at actual and forecast variables. The pink line is the forecast, in this case, for interest rates. And you can see that interest rates are expected to decline by as much as 150 basis points or so over the forward horizon because the Fed succeeds in returning inflation to target that the healing of supply chains from the pandemic, the ongoing normalization in the economy, and importantly, the restraint on demand from cumulative prior tightening, cumulative prior monetary policy, all does its job on returning inflation to target. And as we toggle the page, if interest rates and inflation fall back to more normal levels, then the unemployment rate should stay fairly low. You can see the pink forecast here. And if nominal GDP growth is trundling along, then corporate profit should be fine also. Now that's the, the happy side of things. I'd suggest that if you let your eyeballs rest on the unemployment history here, you'll know that never has the unemployment rate risen by just 1% and then stopped every time that the Fed has embarked on a tightening cycle to try and tame inflation, the unemployment rate has shot up by much more than this forecast amount. And that's why this path to a soft landing is very narrow. The track record is a perfect zero for central banks globally here. And with that in mind, we're going to now move over to page 17 of this rather glorious deck to look at the drivers of inflation more specifically. And so here we see two things. The first is that monetary policy, proxied by the change in the money supply here, year on year measure of M2, and fiscal policy, which is over here in the bottom right hand side, were hugely stimulative over the pandemic. The budget deficit where I'm jiggling the mouse, hopefully you can see that on screen, was quite literally on wartime footings. Given that's a $17 trillion economy running a 15% fiscal deficit is pretty enormous. So wartime footings is pretty apt. And the monetary policy lever was essentially set at the equivalent of a big bazooka. That's into the pandemic. Then we get the vaccines. The consumer goes out and is armed with a tremendous balance sheet. They spend that balance sheet at a time in which a lot of production is essentially shut in. And with supply unable to respond to the shift in aggregate demand, we hence have our inflation. So that was thing one to note from this collection of graphs. Thing two to note is that fast forwarding to now, we have a very different picture. Namely, we've got highly contractionary monetary policy. You can see for the first time in decades, the money supply is outright contracting. And it's very important to note that market expectations for inflation have stayed pretty well behaved over this time. They've remained anchored effectively. And the only thing that separated us from the 1980s inflation era was that for the most part, consumers and corporates always believed, they never lost faith that central banks could, could and would act to restrain inflation as they're doing so now. And that's what you see on these measures of median expected inflation and five year, five year forward break even inflation expectations. Now, moving to slide 18, the progress to date on combating inflation has been pretty substantial. So new and used cars have been a huge contributor to inflation and at long last auto production is now responding. There had been a fire in Japanese semiconductor manufacturers, a key one in the supply chain. And so all of these cars, which were almost fully built, but for the chips could not sell. Well, the factory, that crucial link in the chain, that was repaired, the semis flowed, and US automotive production has now shot up after a huge drawdown over the past few years. Similarly, during the pandemic, people did tire of living with their flatmates who had also been working from home and wanted their own space. So housing and shelter demand shot up, but that too is now normalizing. 
and Zillow and other measures of market rental rates are in outright deflation. So the various measures of inflation that you see on the left-hand side, which are already printing annualized rates that aren't too far from the inflation target, these are only going to improve. So that's an excellent thing. On the right-hand side, we've got the supply chain trackers that look at things like volume, throughput at the port of LA, shipping rates, freight rates, trucking availability, uh, inventory stock controller surveys, things like that. That's all captured in these indices here. And these are, are behaving well, showing that supply chains are healing. So we've got very good news on that front. Now we're going to switch from something centric like the US to commodities, a more global phenomena, uh, which we will find over here on page 49. I'll expand it so you can see it again more clearly. There's a few crucial takeaways here. So the first one is that the Russian invasion of Ukraine drove up commodity prices by a very large margin, most especially oil and gas, which in turn drove coal. And then because oil, gas and coal are inputs to electricity and power, energy intensive commodities like steel and aluminium, alumina refining, that all shot up, which then spilt over into pretty much all goods uh, that we produce. However, despite sanctions, Russian hydrocarbons continued to find their way into market. So for example, China is importing a lot of oil from Malaysia. It's in fact importing far more oil than Malaysia can actually produce. In other words, it's Russian oil, it's Iranian oil, it's Venezuelan oil, just with a different uh, logo slapped on the side of the uh, ship. So it does mean that that big supply crunch that was feared didn't actually last. And those hydrocarbons found their way to market. And then given that interest rates and the US dollar went up by a lot, commodity prices have subsequently fallen. And they've fallen hard across just about everything that you can see there on screen in some instances down by almost 80 to 90 uh, percentage points. And that's had a really strong disinflationary impulse in addition to that positive story on say US automotive production or uh, market uh, rental based measures. So now we can start to, to bring it home. I uh, mentioned that I'm only talking for 10 minutes. We're now going to look at Australia. So we're very close to the end of my presentation. We'll move over to page 59 and examine some of the RBA forecasts. So we've got the forecasts issued from a few months ago uh, toward the back end of late last year. And then the most recent ones on the uh, summary of economic projections uh, from last month, uh, May 2023. And I suppose as your eyeballs rove across those uh, graphs there, you can see that the RBA is in a very similar boat to the US, maybe a touch worse, a bit slower off the mark to, to tighten policy. Inflation is a little bit more entrenched here than the US and Europe, but otherwise pretty similar. N note also that unemployment rate forecast, where I'm jiggling the mouse, that's forecast to rise from about 3.5% currently to a little over 4.5 percentage points. And so it's got more or less that exact same feel of the challenge that I outlined for you about the US employment rate rising, unemployment rate rising by about a, a percent or so, and then just sitting there all nicely behaved. So that's what the RBA expects, but it is, it's a very sizable challenge. They expect and require business and dwelling investment to be weak over the forward horizon out to about 2025, 2026. And that gives rise to this last bullet point that you can see there on screen about how the pointy parts of the market uh, will suffer. So now we'll step over into Aussie-centric inflation. And we can see the same story here of incredibly stimulatory monetary and fiscal policy support. Our measures on the budget balance were about 12 percentage points of, of GDP on a $2 trillion economy, which was essentially at a, a magnitude we'd never seen before at a time when production was shut in. And of course, that drove the strongest employment outcomes that we had seen in over 60 years. So we've got underemployment, underutilization, and of course the unemployment rate. Uh, and I would suggest that current unemployment at 3.55% is well below any estimate of the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment called the NARU, which is the fancy technical term that the RBA boffins are trying to uh, back sell for and equilibrate policy to. And of course, all of that translating into robust wages growth and indeed those inflationary pressures.
Okay, so coming to the last two slides from me, and so we have a, a picture a little bit like the following. The cash rate futures market will have, uh, by the time we peak in September or November, have repriced by just a touch under five full percentage points, 500 basis points, which is pretty staggering. On the mortgage and lending side, which is the data on the right-hand side, one, they're large, two, they're responding to the cash rate, and then three, because we've got these large serviceability buffers from APRA, from the regulator, the new loan assessment on a home is, is closer to, to 9%. Uh, which is truly staggering if you think of those people rolling off from a fixed rate loan of about two and change. Uh, and consequently, last slide from me, uh, that has more or less crushed the construction industry. We've uh, shown on screen approvals, new loan commitments, all running well below trend. Um, I won't show it here due to time constraints, but we've now had many downgrades as well uh, from the retail sector, particularly the listed retail sector, and that's uh, most prominent in the consumer discretionary names. Some of the unlisted names like David Jones have shown that uh, retail sales over the past, say, six to eight weeks have really fallen off a cliff, which shows just how much pressure the consumer is under. So to conclude on this whirlwind tour that took in the states, global demand, commodities, and then Australian-centric measures uh, on inflation, will, will these measures work? Yes, absolutely. The power of monetary and fiscal policy is, is absolute. The only question is whether or not they take the economy with it or, or whether policymaking can be deft enough, responsive enough, and the economy resilient enough. Uh, to weather the storm and to emerge on a, a glide path that is, is consistent with a soft landing. But I might pause there, conscious of that uh, 10 minute time horizon. I can see from my timer that I just squeaked mm -hmm. it in. Uh, so I'll stop sharing my screen and then take guidance. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, lots to unpack there. Um, some. Um, uh, and, and it'd be interesting now to hear from, from, from some of our other panelists, particularly around the sectors as to, you know, what they're seeing. Um, just I might start with you, you know, stubborn price inflation, supply chain was, although um, with with some of the, the stats that David um, referenced, it looks like, um, you know, it's, it's the supply crunch isn't lasting and supply chains are, 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 are doing better now. Um, what are you seeing across the sector? Yeah, thank, thanks, Mahisha. So absolutely. I mean, during the COVID pandemic, I think we saw, you know, supply chain interrupted by obviously factories shutting down, lack of lack of supply um, for the increased demand on goods. So I think people's in income at that point was being spent on, uh, their disposable income was being spent on goods and services as they couldn't go anywhere. Uh, that has eased a little bit, but I think from reports that we've seen, the manufacturers are still seeing challenges in that area and that's affecting their ability to to deliver and to produce goods as quickly as they'd like. I mean, again, interest rates is uh, cause, putting putting increased costs on suppliers. And again, I think there's some pressure on that too. So that's been that's just been an interesting uh, aspect of the in, 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 interest rate rises. Thanks, Jess. And, and moving to agribusiness, again, uh, a sector that was hard hit um, by, by, by the last couple of years. Um, Many challenges, and obviously adding to that weather and biosecurity. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's not been easy um, as an agribusiness operator. Um, what are what are you seeing, um, Ross, um, across your clients? It's been uh, it's been interesting. Obviously, the supply chain, as as indicated, caused farmers a lot of consternation back in 2021. But it certainly has stabilised. We're start, starting to see uh, some of the import prices, such as uh, chemicals and fertiliser, that's actually coming down. So that's actually good news for our farmers. Uh, fortunately for our farmers, most of them had really good seasons. So the last couple of years have been record production years. So they've had you know, great great seasons, pretty good pricing too. So generally speaking, they've done really well in that sense. So it's obviously a general observation. Um, obviously with that comes um, significant tax liabilities and the instant asset write-off as a, as a stimulus measure has just been great for farmers. They've brought forward capital expenditure to actually um, write down their tax liabilities and it's worked extremely well. Unfortunately, I guess you know that, that sugar hit's gonna stop 30 June when the instant asset right off reduces down to $20,000. So there's not gonna be quite the same get out of jail card as, as it was previously. 
So look, I think that's going to uh, cause some consternation going forward. I think it could be interesting to see what impact that has on machinery dealers in terms of you know, what their order book looks like post post 30 June. There could be a contraction in, uh, in demand, I think, going forward. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, the other big thing in, in farming sector is the value of farmland has just jumped through the roof in recent times. And, and look, that's causing some problems for farmers looking to expand also causing us a few succession planning issues when we come back to the, the family farmer, the disparity between on-farm assets and uh, the farmland and, and plant and equipment and everything else compared to off-farm assets is just getting bigger and bigger. So it makes the succession planning quite quite challenging for us. So look, uh, I think, unfortunately, uh, we've had some really good times. I think there's gonna be a, a bit of a perfect storm um, coming towards us so in Up terms ahead. of what's happening yeah, in, mm. in the near future. And mm. just to add to Ross's comment there, Mahisha, obviously the yeah. manufacturing industry is seeing the same. The, the uh, removal of the temporary full expensing measures means those outright deductions for equipment for equipment used in R and D aren't going to be available from from one July. So yeah, those sort of those government, um, I guess the, the incentives are through COVID are sort of being removed, and we're going back to kind of business as usual, I guess. Yeah, and then. Uh, it, it is in, in, in you know when when that stimulus is is pulled back that you 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 need to continue to stay agile, Craig. Um, you know, and, and from 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 the advice you give, um, you know, where uh, planning and and preparing is 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 of extreme importance. Um, you know, what can what can small businesses do? Uh, to really kind of navigate um, this era of uncertainty. Mm. It's a no, thank you, Mahisha. It's a um, <clears throat> it's an interesting um, it's an interesting time. I'm, a lot of volatility. I think if you're a small business owner and you pick up the newspaper, you're probably freaking out every day because um, you, you know even just looking at some of those charts that David had, I, I can imagine there are many small business owners out there just completely overwhelmed. The interest rates going up or they're going down is unemployment i can't find staff um etc so so um it's volatile um there's so many input factors coming into what you have to think about in running your business um the the best the best advice i can give just on that is um in in, in periods of high volatility um it is important to be agile um, when one thinks about what does agile mean, it has a whole bunch of meanings, but basically it means the ability to adapt quickly. Um, and if you're a small business owner and you're seeking to adapt quickly to what's going around you, um, you there's, there's a couple of things. I think you, know, you need to be proactive and not reactive. Um, sometimes as a small business owners, we can be reactive to information as opposed to proactive. So that's one thing. Um, another thing for smaller business owners to, to, to really look at is unit economics. So that is, you know, what does it cost for every hour of service I provide and what do I charge? Uh, what does it cost me for every kilogram of product I produce or supply versus well, what do I sell it at? Um, it's sometimes more difficult at, at the small business level to actually have those unit economics. Um, in a period like now, we've got volatile pricing impacts all around, what, what you don't want is just to be relying on what I would describe as runoff budgets, um, which I think most small business owners would know are those ones where you're just rolling over last year and there are these whole numbers for your costs and revenues and custom estimates going out. Now, now is really the time you've got to try and break that down to the unit level um, so that you can understand every day and every week what your unit cost is so that you can reprice and understand what that price elasticity is with your your customers so um, one of the things we have to be able to do to adapt to that market volatility is get down to the unit economic level and that also means we need to make sure we're we've got the right systems in place in our business that's actually giving us that data because we'll need that data to be able to react to the market Thanks, Craig. I might just pause there um, just to invite our audience, um, those uh, you logged in, to to post any questions to to David or any of our um, other panelists um, here today. Um, please just do that via the chat. Um, Adam, we haven't heard from you yet. Um, yet, um, you know, obviously the housing and 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 construction sectors featured quite heavily in in David's market update. Um, 
Is there more bad news to come? What are you seeing? Yeah, thanks, Mahisha. Um, yeah, the, the construction sector's definitely been definitely been doing it tough. So you look at all those cost pressures, inflation, all the rest of it. Um, you can imagine a lot of the construction sector, particularly you know, home mass home building and things like that. It's fixed price contracts that have been negotiated and entered into at a particular point in time, maybe 12, 18 months ago, when there was some level of understanding as to the costs that they were going to be incurring and, and obviously the rule you know the margins and the rules have all moved so we've seen a lot of stress in the construction sector particularly in home building um i think you'll see more bad news in that space before you hear more good news it seems to be sort of every other week there's another sort of construction company that's found themselves in a in a difficult situation but um, you know that's been problematic progress claims have been problematic the weather's been problematic and the ability to get people to site the access to resources and contractors and stuff has been difficult historically through COVID and coming out of that we're starting to see immigration pick up so hopefully that'll kind of free that up a bit but you know the sector uh, in and of itself again on, on I guess on the home building side we talk a lot about lack of supply and you know new homes coming to the market and the you know housing affordability issues all that is you know that is largely driven as well not by just the cost pressures and things like that but the ability for these guys to get out and finish some of these builds um, and it's been really hard. And so I think you'll see a few more that, that come unstuck there. Um, uh, so things will probably get worse before they, before they do get better. Um, notwithstanding that, there's still a huge amount of uh, demand out there. So we do a lot of work in infrastructure and large scale construction. There's still huge demand uh, in the sector for, for gigs coming on board. And I think one of the key behaviors we're really seeing and, and some adapted to this early and whether or not it becomes mainstream, I, I don't know, but uh, just really rethinking the way that they enter into some of these contractual arrangements. So perhaps the old the old way of sort of the fixed price contract um, we're starting to see negotiated further away from and having this very level of vari variability, particularly in a vo volatile market, as Craig says, to just allow some of these cost in um, increases and you know variability in these jobs. So I think we're seeing a bit more of that. Hopefully that'll help um, you know improve the sector a little bit and, and sort of bolster that to can you know ensure the construction sector sort of sees out this downturn i'd like to get jess's take on that as well just in the area of you know renegotiating uh yeah. contracts um you know in in, in uh, reviewing and, and and reassessing what questions should a should a manufacturer be asking in in scrutinizing and, and reviewing contracts yeah, or, or like Adam says, the increased costs, you know, means a fixed term contract in property construction isn't necessarily feasible or, or going to lead to good outcomes. And similarly, I think in manufacturing, clients should be looking at their trade terms. You know, we spoke to clients who asked to, um, who were previously paying uh, a, once the goods have been shipped from overseas. Now they're paying a 30 percent deposit on, on order. You know, they, and they have to take into account for those kind of things on their on their cash flow and the, their payments out. So similarly, they should be looking at their contracts, their payment terms, whether there could be um, bulk discounts for those that pay early, that kind of thing, just to increase that cash flow. Uh, and obviously, at any time, working capital could be improved, as you mentioned earlier, Mahisha, with potential, you know, R&D claims, grants, that kind of stuff that can really help help on that. And I can also provide access to finance, whether it be through the bank or other financiers. So I, I agree that the, the rising costs is, is 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 impacting business. And I think the, probably the, the key there would be considering the terms of trade in your contracts so that you can get more certainty around pricing and, and, and your cash flow. Mm. Um, David, just looking at um, you know the, the the global economy for a minute, and and you 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 said that um, the U.S. economy obviously plays a, a big part to uh, how how things happen and its impact on on the the Australian economy. And um, I think we saw last month that inflation in the U.S. has come down, um, and they've had. 10 interest rate um, increases, 10 consecutive interest rate increases. So curious, it, do, do you think that that's, uh, uh, you know, that's by, by, by design? Um, so their, their policy, uh, policy has worked and, and um, or, or is working, um, or is it, you know, sheer luck or an accident? No. Oh, no, no small amount of luck to be sure. Uh, I think it was very possible for a while there that things got dramatically out of hand. They were already bad, but 
could easily have been worse with a militaristic spillover from Ukraine and Russia to NATO more broadly. That would have decimated supply chains. It wasn't clear what China wanted to do with the South China Sea and Taiwan. It's probably still not clear, but I think some of those extreme tail risks got removed. Diplomacy to varying degrees prevailed. Cooperation between Republicans and Democrats proved just enough to get past the madness of the debt ceiling. How much of that is luck? How much of that is fortuitous? Probably debatable, but there's certainly things that are outside the remit of the central bank and central banks more globally. So yeah, I think no small amount of luck. There's an element in which policy to date in terms of its success is a bit like the old joke about jumping out the window from a 10-story building and by floors five, six, seven, so far, so good. It's until you hit the ground that it matters. Uh, and I think that that's where we stand with policy. So they are being reactive to the data. They're as forward-looking as they can be, but the macroeconomic crystal ball is incredibly cloudy. So tighten, 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 pause, see how things are going. And if we wind up pulling off the soft landing, it will be a central bank victory for the ages. It will be textbook economics 101 case studies taught to undergraduates, that sort of thing. We are just a little bit behind our American friends in terms of our progress. At the same time, the RBA is being a little bit more cautious because we don't have those lovely 30-year fixed rate mortgages. We have a preponderance of variable rate mortgages and what fixed rate we have is three to five years at the max and is now rolling off, producing that income shock that one of the other panelists alluded to earlier. So it is it is too early to tell, but so far the signs are very positive. Our base case for, for Goldilocks for the soft landing, we upgraded it to about 65 percentage points. It's more likely than not, but we're not out of the woods yet. And so in terms of what you can do, well, forward planning, having a good sense of the input pressures of cost across your business. Don't stress your balance sheet. Don't embark on a big CapEx program. Optimize those cash flows. Be mindful of significant seasonal or second half uh, working capital cash flow drags. If you have to cut costs or sell assets, be first, not last in the cycle. Those are all eminently sensible things to do in an uncertain cycle. Craig, your thoughts to that? I mean, some some uh, key things uh, that David mentioned are, are probably everyday conversations you have, um, you know, where you look at, talk to business about looking at cost base. Um, what are some of the decisions that, you know, businesses would be looking to 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 make around, for instance, how much of that increase you pass on? Mm. <clears throat> No, it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a, I'd look, it's a very good um, point, I think, Mish. I think um, there's a saying that goes, if you're um, standing on a railway line, um, you've got to move left or move right, but standing still is not going to be the right answer when there's a freight train heading in your direction. So I think, I think now's not the time to do nothing. Um, and I want to sort of just echo a lot of things that, that David was saying. So I think, Particularly again at small business, where we're we're at effect to um, the the one thing that I think you know we should probably accept as in small business is that we can't influence a lot of these factors. So if I'm running my small um, local business, I'm not going to be able to change what's going on with inf in interest rates. I'm not going to be able to impact what's happening with inflation, unemployment rates, um, and 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 often the case with this cohort of business, it's very difficult to also input to impact the you're often at effect from a very large supplier. So there's often an imbalance. So you're a, you're a price taker in terms of your input prices often, um, whether that's labor pricing, whether that's material pricing. So again, more, 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 like, more now than ever, it's the time to be very proactive. So to take in what you can, um, as we, as we sort of said before, move really right down to that unit economics level. Um, and, and challenge yourself, depending on what you do in your business, to understand what it costs you per product, per hour, per kilogram, whatever it is, and, and review that, that price elasticity with, with your customers. Um, I'm probably showing my age, but I know 25 years ago when I first came to the, the, the work uh, you know, um, environment, you, know, you reviewed your price list once a year. 
you'd have a I remember being an auditor and going auditing companies and wanting to see their price lists and they'd you know we'd review it once a year um you'd go in you know even if you go into your local cafe and you have a look at the price list on the board you know if you go, do that nowadays you can almost every week it's changing <laughs> so uh, basically don't be at add effect to, to all of that um and um, I'm sure a little bit later, um, Misha will talk a bit about interest rates as separate from inflation. But I think the discussion today is very much around, you know, inflation, interest rates and pricing. And there's sort of two hemispheres. I think we've been speaking quite a bit about the um, the impact of inflation and pricing. Hmm. And I think, again, my, my key message I'll, yeah, I'll keep uh, making is about the unit economics. We can probably talk a little bit later about the the pricing on capital, which David's been touching on. But again, as a small business, you've got to be adjusting your pricing and understanding your input costs literally almost in real time. Um, and then there's also the price of capital, and we'll 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 probably talk on that um, in a short while. Mm, yeah, good point. I might just pause to to take a question that's come through from Christine, who's. Um, who, who's, uh, who's, who's got a question for, for Ross around um, agriculture. Um, uh, she says agriculture's price takers, not makers. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming Christine's looking for, for some strategies probably around, you know, how she would adjust her, uh, well, for, for, you know, agribusiness operators around um, what they should be doing, you know, similar to what 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 Craig just uh, has been has been talking about and discussing around unit economics, Ross. You know, what are some very sort of actionable things that you're telling clients to to consider? Yes, Mahisha, it's a good question. Um, I think um, one of the things, that, yeah, the question about being a price taker, it, it's very relevant in in agriculture in the farming sector. And look, I think the other thing that you know we just got to be clear upon is is sometimes people lose discipline when things are going pretty well. And as I said, the agri sector has been going extremely well. So what I generally think, you can only control what you can control in a lot of respects. So that's a similar point to what Craig was saying. So I think the discipline kind of needs to come back into your expenditure, being really clear about what you plan to do expenditure-wise. And then you've just got to remember all the basics. So you know, one of the things obviously that's clear to, to any small business is, is you know, your labour force. And, and so you've got to make sure you commit to to your uh, employees, make sure that you keep them on board. Um, obviously the cost of replacing somebody is very significant. So it's looking after your staff, making sure you're looking after that to, to address any any issues there. And you know, just being aware that there is a bit of a perfect storm happening. Um, you know, we, we've got higher interest rates, we've got you know, potentially higher taxes or definitely higher taxes coming forward. You know, there's other inflationary pressures coming to bear. So it's just being disciplined, having a really good awareness of what your cash flow projections look forward, similar to what Craig's saying, have a really good understanding of, of where you stand in real time. So that's probably the, the answer going forward, I believe. Uh, you can't do too much about pricing. Obviously, obviously you can try to you know, try to manage that best you can, but you've just got to be really disciplined. I think that's the, the key message I'd give people right now. Thanks, Ross. And um, wages was uh, an area that uh, a couple of you have mentioned. Um, might just uh, look to David for some answers around wages growth. Um, wh where where do you think um, that's going to sit, or you know, is it is it going to start to pick up, um, or or is it not broad based yet, David? Sorry, I was just taking myself off mute. Uh, no, it's it's already picked up. It's already broad based. It's already quite high. And that is just very simply a function of the unemployment rate currently is a lot uh, further below what the sustainable level of employment is for the economy at large. And those wage pressures are going to, to continue to be there. We've seen fair work awards. We've seen minimum wages all creeping up, uh, unionized labor rates creeping up. That will happen until the unemployment rate moves higher. The unemployment rate will move higher as those uh, cash flow constraints bite due to the binding constraints of higher interest rates. So we're, we're only halfway through the journey. Uh, rates have gone up. Now is the time to, to sit back and watch their effect. And that's when wages growth will start to normalise. But until that happens, the, the pressure or bias is to the upside. And Jess, um, 
on the ground, wages growth, what, what, what are you seeing and hearing? Yeah, that's, that's a really, really interesting point around the interest rates and the wages. So as the, as the manufacturing industry has always seen, a, you know, a skilled shortage labour, and that's not got any better during COVID when we weren't getting any, um, any, any arrivals from overseas. So <clears throat> the recent budget did comment on increasing the, the skilled, skilled migrant wage quite significantly to levels not dissimilar to that to, of the UK and um, US. So it'll be interesting to see if that helps that uh, the industry. I think in, that's a relatively positive piece of news for the for, for skilled labour. But obviously, as as David said, with the other rise on costs, it's, it's, it's just another one to add to the mix. But, you know, that's where we, ha we haven't seen, we've always struggled with, you know, boilermakers, welders and that kind of thing. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if the so I think it was thirteen thousand dollar increase in, in the annual wage for migrants does it does help that help that um, predicament, but um yeah I can it's 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 interesting because that's quite a quite a big jump I thought. Um, and Craig, we 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 definitely should look at interest rates. We've uh, talked at at length now around um, impact of inflation. Um, the, I suppose, yeah, the, the jury's probably out around, you know, how many more interest rate uh, increases uh, are, are to come. But what what's your advice as a small business operator, uh, you know, in accounting for potentially more pain in the horizon? Uh, again, reactionary um, and, 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 and proactive kind of um, uh, strategies to to look at. Again, I think as a small, um, you know, business owner and and just about anyone, I think predicting interest rates is as hard as predicting anything. And and who knows how much more will they flatten? However, but I think what we know as an absolute fact is that the the cost of capital has gone up extraordinarily, extraordinarily, in the last couple of years. We've gone from you know zero interest rates during COVID to some significant interest rates. And so that's on the cost of debt. And then um, with the cost of equity, um, quite simply, as soon as you see volatility in the economy, when you see wobbles in growth, when you see a whole variety of things, the cost of equity goes up as well because people want a higher rate of return. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of bigger level impacts and then there's some, some real practical smaller ones. And I think one of the things that'll probably impact a lot of small well, things that will impact a lot of small businesses is, the cost of capital has gone up. And so when the cost of capital goes up, um, thresholds for new projects and for new expenditures, and this is something um, that, that Adam will no doubt have sort of touched on, there is still a healthy pipeline out there of infrastructure, but the hurdle rates for new projects will go up. So if you look in the mining sector, if you look in the oil and gas sector, and even if you look in the infrastructure sector, those hurdle rates would have been much lower a couple of years ago. Increased cost of capital means that the hurdle rates for um, a number of these highly stimulatory projects are, will go up. And that will mean that if you're a smaller business that supplies into any of these areas um, impacted by major projects, it's something to consider. Bring that a little bit more down to the, the small business level. Um, very simply, um, cost of debt's gone up a lot. Um, so it's a little bit like your pricing strategy. I think capital management, even at the SME level, is now going to be very important. Um, and what that means is that you need to be planning for your liquidity and your your your, your debt management. So if you're a small business um, who has facility and you have debt, uh, you need to be having a look at that. And you need to be having a look at that from a number of perspectives. Um, you need to be having a look at what will an increase in interest rates mean for you. You need to have a look at your liquidity position. Uh, because again, uh, there's a lot of small business out there that relies on a bank overdraft or a, a debtor um, um, receivable facility or, or, or some sort of working capital funding mechanism. Um, you've got to have a look to see, but particularly if you're if there's going to be a lag between increased input prices and you passing that cost on, if you adjust in real time, you're keeping your net real cash flow equal. If you're not reacting in real time, you run the risk of this increasing cost base, flat revenue base, and a and and and, and a cash flow compression. So, review your working capital. Um, you know, potentially now, if you can, now's an opportunity to maybe deleverage. Um, 
we have, and you see this in the housing market, we saw an, an extraordinary amount of leverage come into the market during zero and low interest rates. Um, and so we've had quite a rapid reversal of that. So you need to be having a think about, is there an ability for you to deleverage? Can you refinance? Can you debt consolidate? Um, speak to your bank early. I think the one thing for small business again is you want to be proactive, not reactive with your bank. You don't want to be going to your bank saying, do you some a bit of strife here? Can you help me? You, you, you actually want to be going to your bank and saying, I've just done a revision of my two-year forecasts. I've broken it down. I'm looking at my liquidity and I want to increase my overdraft from 500,000 to 600,000 to see me through for next year rather than arriving at that place and then all of a sudden everyone's a bit stressed out. Um, so yeah, I think I think obviously it, it's a funny one because I think um, we're talking about cost increase across the board, but yeah, co cost of capital has gone up. And what does that mean for small businesses? It means your funding costs are going up and that could be coinciding with a liquidity crunch. Adam, your thoughts on that, uh, you know, that bank uh, discussions and, and prep that you do with, uh, with, with, with your bank is, is absolutely critical. Um, mm. What are you also um, advising these days? Yeah, look, I think um, if I can maybe just reflect on the development sector and sort of what we're seeing in there as a result of this sort of capital piece, I'd say the key words that spring to mind are uncertainty and inaction. And so we've had a lot of large scale developers that um, were previously very bullish acquiring, you know, sites when, it, you know, when they became available, they've all had to stop and rethink that. And we've got a lot of developers that are sitting on the sideline waiting for opportunities because they're looking at their cost of capital they're looking at what the market is saying is available in terms of access to sites and their feasibilities with the inc increased construction costs as well. They're just not stacking up. So the projected internal rates of return or their benchmark profits that they need to hit on some of these developments just aren't there. So there's a lot of inaction in the market. And unfortunately, that's going to have a flow on effect to actually seeing you know projects completed. And again, there's housing supply issues that fall off the back of that. But there's, yeah, a lot of inaction. I think these the, the sentiment seems to be we're going to wait to see where the where the these, these interest rate increases stop or start to stabilize. And that's not to say that they're going to wait until they retract, but at least it gives them a level of certainty and comfort that the volatility is starting to come out of the market and they can start to make some informed decisions um, whether they go or no go on particular projects. And um, quite a few people have mentioned sort of old sayings and I, I kind of felt like I had to come up with my own but in, in, in construction there's sort of um, measure twice cut once because uh, once you go you are you know you're already in it so a lot of uh, our development clients it's a lot of time on the DD a lot of time on the feasibility side of things as well to make sure that the end sale prices that they're going to be getting they're factoring their cost of acquisition their cost of capital and that in the future the market's going to be there to sell off this product. A question here um, around minimizing financial risks for a for a for a for a, a business that's that's going through growth at the moment. Craig, uh, what uh, what would you do? Well, it's a um, it's a very good question, and I think even yesterday I had a meeting with a, a startup, uh, a, you know, tech startup, fantastic business, great. Uh, product they're developing, uh, you know, it's a combination of sort of tech and, and green energy. And I think, um, I mean, you, you, so so if we talk about growth companies and growing companies, you know, these the, these are some of the companies that are going to that are and already have been the hardest hit. If you look at the the significant downgrade we've had at, on you know in the emerging tech sector, for example, on the ASX in 2022, um, you know, you, you read the press at the moment quite a lot um, about challenges with VC funding, you know, uh, take this back two years ago, and no doubt Jess might have some views on this, you know, there was free capital available for, um, for, for, you know, a lot of emerging technology and growing growth businesses. And that's sort of fallen completely on its head now today. So a couple of things, I'm, I'll, I'll let Jess talk about grant accessing grants, because I guess, and, and R&D, because that's, that is, that's a source of, of support for, growth that is there you know during these kind of times um 
and I think again, I mean, you know, if, if I look at the startups that I've been talking to in the last while, um, you know, I mean, debt's not going to be available for a lot of growing companies. And even if you're a profitable growth company, you've got to be careful with the additional leverage. The cost of equity has also gone up, right? So it's going to be more expensive for you to um, to 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 take on board more equity. But I think um, in terms of financial risk, um, L leveraged capital has a very um, significant ultimate risk. Uh, and if I'm being very sort of blunt about that, if you borrow money from a bank and it's senior and it's secured or from anyone and things go horribly wrong, there's extraordinarily bad outcomes. Whereas whereas people who invest equity do that for a, a purpose, that it's, it's people who take risk. So um, you will have to look at your funding mix if you're looking to grow. If you're a small business that's already profitable and you've got working capital facilities and you have a relationship with a bank, you got to really get on the front foot with that. If you're an emerging business that is struggling with access to debt, um, I'm probably going to pause right there and let Jess talk about accessing grants and, and, and other things because I think that's probably an area you need to be looking at. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Craig. And I hear that a lot, you know, when I'm at I'm various in investment or equity raising capital and events and that's type they do they do lean towards, you know, how to access government funding. There's a there's a bit of change in there at the moment. I mean, uh, there's the RD program still available, hasn't changed. In fact, but the benefits in the last two years have, have, have seen, increased quite significantly. So for large and small businesses, the RD program is still there to, to access for potentially refundable tax offsets grants a little bit in, in a little bit of flux um the budget again removed some of the sort of immediate sources of funding probably as you alluded to craig for example in new south wales there was a small minimum viable product twenty five thousand dollar grant available for companies matched funding which they've recently removed and that's you know just come with the change in both state and federal government but you know at the moment the labor government is formulating their policy around where they want to target their national reconstruction fund which has replaced the uh basically the modern manufacturing funding that was um that was in place from the previous government and the, really they're just following the government priority sector so you know defense renewable energy food and agri medical critical minerals and transport i think are the main sectors that the government's focusing on and what else they focus on they focus on job creation there's some other grants like the uh regional investment funds regional economic development funds that can assist with that as well and then the other one i'm seeing a lot of and particularly relevant to manufacturing is around the green green technologies and renewable technologies there's you know if you if you're doing if you basically making your business cleaner there's there's a, there's money out there we've seen a lot of focus towards electric vehicles that kind of thing so you're absolutely right there's funding there it sh should look at it um it's a little bit changing at the moment we're just waiting on sort of the last half of this calendar year where the government will announce where they're going to read specific, more specifically where they're going to redirect their funds to but it's, it is something you should be thinking about as I mentioned earlier in the call for refundable tax claimants they can finance their um, refunds relatively easily not it's not the cheapest option but it's obviously easier than going to the bank or refinancing through other ways so yeah definitely take advantage of that too. Hmm. And, um, you know, if, if you're ever uncertain uh, about where to start, uh, we've got uh, Dr. Rebecca Barnes in our team who uh, will be able to help you out. Um, so, so please reach out to her. Um, Ross, the ag with an area that you that you explore um, in 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 the report um, is is you know preparing for a sustainable future as as a as a strategy that that could potentially help you also navigate you know some of the uncertainty at the moment um getting green credentials for supply chains and understanding reducing your carbon footprint i know you've done a bit of work um as well around advising clients around you know carbon farming so you know is it a misnomer to think that becoming a more environmentally sustainable agribusiness is is going to cost more money as well or you know is there is there some some clarity you can provide around that area yeah, certainly. I mean, I think um, that's one of, I guess, the frustrations I think that you see at the moment is, is everybody looks at this sometimes and say it's a, it's going to be a costly exercise. Um, I think there's an opportunity to improve productivity. Essentially, improving productivity reduces emissions. So, you know, if you can improve your productivity, you can actually reduce your emissions. So there's, I guess, some pretty good alignment with stuff that you can do. So an example I, I use quite frequently is if you're a, a cattle producer, and because of genetics and uh, and good management practices, you can turn your cattle off quicker than your neighbour. Essentially, your emissions per 
per calf is lower, you know, because the lifetime of that client of that methane producing cow or calf is is actually less. So, so there's really good alignment sometimes with undertaking a carbon farming project that's all about improving your productivity, but at the same time reducing your, your emissions. So I think it's probably trying to do the research, trying to identify what you're trying to achieve in, in your farming practices and how does that align with reducing your emissions. So trying to get that sort of pretty good alignment and then you can then you can commit to a project. I think the, the thing I would say, just a word of caution, a couple of words of caution, you really need to benchmark your farm um, or understand your business in terms of carbon emissions. So just you know, baseline it, work out where you are at the moment. And then you're looking at projects that you know can perhaps generate Australian carbon credit units, and then it's a case of whether you're retaining those for your for your own use to offset your emissions, or whether it's actually become an alternative revenue stream. So you know, for our pastoralists up north, they're doing quite nicely out of um, you know generating carbon credits that they'll sell as an alternative um, to their to their regular farm farming income or grazing income. So I think there's real opportunities there. And the final thing there, I guess, is just exercise some real due diligence before committing to a project. So just really understand the details. Be- behind the projects, who the proponents are, what the, you know, what they are. So get advice on that as opposed to just sort of signing up uh, without doing that due diligence um, part of it. Absolutely. Um, David, I don't want to end on a gloomy note, but we have a question here around, you know, bankruptcy and um, whether the cost of businesses, uh, cost of businesses, you know, um, as, as they increase, um, having that flow on effect. Um, I suppose the question here might be around particular sectors that will be vulnerable, particularly over the next sort of six months. Um, is there anything that your data points to around, you know, sectors that need to really, really be on it? Um, uh, sure. that, yeah, that you could shed some light oh. on. Uh, it is a little bit gloomy. You're right. I mean, there's fantastic opportunities to make money and to invest, and that's what I do as a fund manager. And many of these opportunities, I think, will underpin pretty strong returns for us on an ex ante forward looking basis over the next five to 10 years. So it's actually a great time to be allocating capital. But that's not really quite the premise of the question. Where is the pain? What's the outlook from a real economy perspective? And where do the bankruptcies sit? There's going to be an enormous number of homeowners that are deeply underwater and are going to have to sell. Unfortunately, they have taken on a standard of living by reaching for housing that they simply cannot service in the current interest rate environment. And that will be a, a not insignificant number. Um, so from a sectoral perspective, households, throw them in there. There's an enormous number of credit risks out there uh, on a per person basis. Then sectors that are more familiar to you in terms of the, the heterogeneity, construction, absolutely. It's those dreaded fixed price lump sum contracts that was it Adam, I think, referenced maybe 20 minutes ago, predicated on a, a set of input costs that are just out of market, deeply out of market now. And so as those homes are delivered, the developer is making a loss, the developer goes under. And so we saw Porter Davies most prominently, who I think was just a year or two earlier, what was it, Victoria's 14th largest home builder and winner of multiple awards, Everything was looking great, and then all of a sudden it wasn't, uh, and then it has a profound flow-on effect. That's that's absolutely going to increase. Um, I can't recall if if I showed it or if it was in another presentation from from earlier, but construction insolvencies are uh, they going to breach three thousand this year? So what were they? Ordinary bottom of the cycle number might be kind of nine hundred going to the wall. Uh, even in good times, that ratcheted up to uh, about fifteen hundred. Uh, as of uh, toward the back end of late last year, might have finished closer to 1,900 from the ASIC insolvencies data. And yeah, that'll breach 3,000. So there'll be a lot of them. And there'll be many names that are familiar to us, uh, particularly if you're from that part of the world. And then you've got the uh, the discretionary retailers where they're, they're loaded to the gills with inventory that, again, is out of market. Uh, so those inventories are going to need to be liquidated. That will decimate margins. So there'll be a whole bunch of covenant breaches for companies engaged in that space, particularly if you're selling stuff that, that isn't an essential. And uh, textiles, apparel, clothing, that all fits the bill. Anything that's not a branded kettle, uh, for example, that's going to be at significant risk of obsolescence and inventory write downs. And if you don't have the balance sheet to withstand it, well, if you can tap equity markets, great, but the vast majority of small to medium enterprise cannot. Uh, it, it's only going to be 
asking for a little bit of grace on debt servicing and perhaps renegotiating terms and tenors there, uh, repayment rates and maturity dates. And that's why the, the advice from the RBA, APRA to the banks on down is, is proactively con contact your banker ahead of time before things get to that crises point. Uh, so yes, definitely not trying to end on a, a doom and gloom. There's there's fabulous opportunities to make money, and I think that we will. We do so in any environment, but distressed opportunities do come to market, and often they produce 10-bagger type returns. So forward-looking outcomes, I think, from an investment perspective are good, but from the real economy perspective, by design, it's meant to get worse from here. Thank you, David. Um, very interesting and, and hopefully useful insights for, for uh, the SME owners in our audience today. Um, I'm afraid that's uh, probably all the time we have today. Um, but just sort of summing up, you know, I think it's in our favor for, for smaller companies that they're often more nimble and um, it allows them to respond quicker to changing market conditions, adjust strategies, adjust um, and, and, and capitalize on emerging trends. So, so read our report um, for, for more detail on what you can do. And I'm um, just going to also uh, share the details of the, the people on our, on our webinar today, if you want to reach out directly to them. Um, with that, thank you for joining us. We look forward to your company again soon.